We try to grapple with knowledge of our world, armed with generally little more than five crude senses and a limited intellect. Essentially, we exist as blind people in a universe of infinite dimensional complexity. This is our handicap when we wish to consider the concept of evil. Now, deciding on whether God exists or not is a binary question. God either exists or he does not. The same goes with evil. It either exists as a malevolent force or it does not. I believe that the more you know about evil, the more able you are to resist becoming its victim. It is too big an undertaking to grasp all the complexities of evil in the space of a simple script. I propose there are three ways of approaching this subject. One, we explore the philosophy of evil. By doing this, we end up in some very deep thought on the concept of what evil is. And even though it may expand our understanding, it is unlikely to be conclusive. Two, we can take a pragmatic approach largely ignore the philosophy by seeing it as unnecessary. Instead, we regard evil as something which is a threat to us and our broader community, based on our own definitions that we identify as a threat. This will inevitably bring us into disagreement with others who see things differently according to their own de definitions. Three, we can choose the denial option, which is we deny evil exists, and dismiss it as a human construct designed as a means of controlling society. I believe this third option is the worst because denial is like abandoning an important issue that affects us all. In this respect, denial is inherently malevolent and an expression of evil itself since it disarms people and makes them defenceless against the ultimate predator. It is the equivalent of sending infants to walk alone in a jungle filled with all kinds of menace, cruelty and malice. And it shrouds us in ignorance, which is one of evil's greatest allies. So we'll look at the philosophy of evil. Now my studies into the nature of evil have led me to conclude that evil is more associated with harm and suffering than it is with death and destruction. Death is a neutral and can be used for good or bad. Does evil need the existence of humans or other intelligent beings to exist? Well, to go deep into the philosophical nature of evil, we cannot avoid going into the subjective and controversial ethereal realm of spirituality. For evil or good to be accepted as being actual entities, they must exist separately to the will and consciousness of man. I do not believe that evil needs consciousness to exist since it has the capacity to subvert thinking individuals and harness them towards maximising suffering. It is my contention that evil and good operate within each of us in conjunction with our own personal understanding of morality. In turn, our morality is heavily influenced by the culture in which we live. Adopting all that we believe is good, as laid down by our culture, does not mean that we are operating as good people. We need a measure that is not made meaningless by subjective and cultural interpretation or personalised opinion. To achieve this, we have to establish facts about the dimensions and nature of evil to produce a common and universal standard by which to guide us. At all times, we need to recognise our own individuality and our relationship with the social conditions in which we live. Even some of our accepted facts about the world only apply in particular conditions. For example, the freezing point of water is widely assumed to be 0 degrees Celsius, or 32 Fahrenheit, but that depends on the density of the water, the presence of inhibitors and the barometric pressure amongst other things. Many facts like this come with a range of caveats, Identifying aspects that we consider evil will also come with caveats. For example, if one person is inflicting pain on another, we might consider that to be an act of evil. But is it if both parties mutually desire it as part of a sadomasochistic encounter? Branches of Evil 
Assuming evil exists, I see evil as falling into three basic categories. Firstly, conscious evil, which is active and deliberate. Secondly, dormant evil, which is hidden, inanimate and possesses potential to do harm. Sometimes it can be referred to as, kind of ironically, an act of God. And thirdly, natural evil, which is uh, meaning something that occurs in or through nature. I've looked at some of the human agents of evil that take the form of psychopaths, sociopaths, psychotics and those who do not identify with any of these conditions. Are any of these helpless actors driven by uncontrollable impulses? Is it fair that psychotics who have no control over their behaviour or even their thought processes should be seen as agents of evil? In the case of evil, it does not matter whether you are a willing actor or not if the action that you take fulfills the requirements of what is deemed evil. The involvement of a person as an actor of evil depends on their susceptibility to its influence. There are extremely few of us who can entirely avoid the influence of evil on our character and behaviour. And this is a key factor in deciding whether someone is evil or not. It is their susceptibility or proneness to commit evil acts. A so-called God-fearing upright person can be seduced into committing an evil act. It does not make them evil people, but it does reveal their vulnerability to seductive influence. There are a number of factors in the human condition that can increase susceptibility to do conscious evil, such as a lack of empathy, illness, emotion and lack of independent thought. Perhaps we should only judge people by their actions and behaviour and only try to ascertain their intentions from what is revealed following an investigation. Whilst there are those who will never be free from the clutches of evil, many others do have the ability to free themselves and continue as loving, caring people. Now, Taking a pragmatic approach to evil, evil targets victims at different levels. Firstly, is the basic individual... Secondly, the group, this can be as small as a couple of people or encompass an entire population. Thirdly, is the species-wide level. Fourthly, global, which goes beyond the species. And fifthly, universal, which goes beyond our planet. As evil operates on different levels, there will be evils that act at an individual level, but that will run contrary to the global evil. So it's not easy to ascertain at what level you're being targeted. Now, evil feeds off negative energy and requires a constant input. Like an organism, evil will seek to maximise production of its food source. Suffering, misery and wanton destruction are all fodder. It may not seem to act logically. It may be that different strands of evil are happening at the same time so that a person from one nation harms another person, whilst a war between those nations is taking place. A doctor may administer a vaccine to children to save them from a dangerous disease, but then an unknown side effect maims some of the children. Evil is like a predator. It goes for weaknesses. It prefers superiority and advantage. This may be a personal flaw or an illness, and through control and domination of its environment and other creatures, it will endeavour to create conditions that will nourish its craving. Everyone has a weakness, and evil will find its way into your life, usually through that weakness. You cannot expunge evil entirely, any more than you can destroy the colour red or the chemical element iron, but you can neutralise its influence and contain it for a while. To fully experience misery and suffering, requires a mechanism whereby an organism can be aware of it and react emotionally. We as humans can provide such a function in spades. Some people get a perverse thrill over watching others suffer and revel in being able to inflict suffering themselves. This is evil working through them and they are conceding to its intoxicating influence. If you observe this then it should serve as a warning. Whilst there may be versions of evil that do desire total annihilation, evil does not always seek it. 
Evil prefers impoverishment and enslavement to death and a way out. Agents of evil, some would call demons, will foster conditions whereby evil can maximise suffering. This would seem to credit evil with logic, when it may often be just motivational craving. Like an alcoholic craving a drink, evil can be addicted to the will it exercises and the harm it inflicts. It will revel in the fear and malaise of doom and can use that to oppress a swathe of unfortunate victims. A brutal massacre in a Brazilian prison resulted in the deaths of dozens of inmates who were not simply just killed but decapitated and had their hearts cut out whilst some were still alive. The routineness of such cruelty is itself an example of the different layers that evil operates at. People with empathic feelings will usually react to learning about this so that they emit negative emotional signals. As with the psychopath, agents of evil may lack empathy but feed off the anguish that others experience through their own empathy. Vampirical in nature and unable to create its own blood, demons thus receive succour from the blood of others. In cosmic terms, evil will thrive where there is life and intelligence, since these have more of a capacity to produce suffering. Many things work in our universe that are due to a combination of other things and not because they themselves exist as physical elements. Evil is not like a standard virus. It has no physical form except through those that it controls. The most important thing for us as humans to understand is its nature and to identify risks within ourselves so that we can minimise its harm. The parasitic organism Toxoplasma gondii functions by taking over the brains of ants and mice and causes them to do suicidal things, like deliberately getting eaten by larger animals. This helps the reproductive cycle of the parasite to the detriment of the host. Evil functions in such a way. Alarmingly, as many as one in three humans may also be infected. And evidence exists to show that humans' behaviour is affected by this infection. For example, it's been cited that if you are infected, you are two and a half times more likely to have a car accident. Evil is like an ethereal animal. It is highly exploitative and parasitic and uses the perverse side of innate intelligence that exists in a natural state within life forms. Thus it can possess high intelligence or low intelligence just as any life form can. It has the capability to harness any life for its own ends. It takes a well-developed mind to understand its nature, its seductive methods of influencing independent will and to be able to resist it. Malevolent psychopaths and serial killers often desire to be caught. After taking pleasure from torturing and murdering a victim, a killer will get a further buzz from the reaction of the grieving loved ones, enabling them and the evil inside to get a double fix from the same victim. Agents of evil will often wear a smug expression. It is their sense of superiority showing through, but it also demonstrates how deeply imbued with evil they have become. Dr Robert Hare, based on his research, devised a psychopathic checklist to help to determine psychopathic tendencies within individuals. Whilst many of the items may also be used to identify the presence of evil, I do not believe his checklist is comprehensive enough to fully identify evil, since it is too closely aligned with the human condition. Moreover, it does not go much into the intensity of evil within each aspect. In the list that follows, it indicates the presence of evil, but this list is not exclusive. There are many things we do not know about other creatures that share our planet. We may have a good understanding of their physiology, but not so much about their personalities. Studies made of ants have found that ants have their own personalities. Behaviour of animals in distress indicate that they are capable of what might be considered cognitive functions assigned to higher life forms. If other animals are capable of cognitive thought and even empathy, then what is there to say that they are not also capable of less desirable characteristics such as psychopathy? 
Where does it stop? Can it be taken down to the microbe level or even to the level of inanimate objects? The problem with inanimate objects is that they do not possess any rudimentary intelligence, but can they retain dormant characteristics? It would seem nonsensical to conceive of such a notion, but how do we know? To assume that things and places contain a resident evil is to start arguing that hauntings are real and malevolence lurks in accursed places. Evil, without the action provided by a living being, can remain dormant and waiting for a stimulus that allows it to act. A snare or a landmine may not be thought of as evil, but they are. They are dormant evils waiting to be activated. Crossing an ice lake may save an arduous and hazardous journey around its perimeter, but it can provide its own dangers that are not always obvious, which can be as harmful as any man-made trap. These are evils because they have the capacity to inflict harm. Getting to understand and define evil does not require belief in fairy tales. There are probably 400 billion stars in our galaxy and over 200 billion galaxies that are detectable. The edges of the universe go way beyond what we can see. For life to exist only on Earth is extremely unlikely. Moreover, other cognitive elements quite likely exist beyond the corporeal existence that we experience every day. How it all works together, or as competitive forces, is the job of science to find out. In spite of some amazing and fantastic discoveries, we have hardly scratched the surface of knowledge. There is so much in our universe that we do not know about or understand, and it seems that the more we find, the more we realise we do not know. Thinking of existence in terms of time and space. Whilst useful in helping us to cope with everyday things and understanding the world about us, is very restrictive as it can obscure our thoughts from not seeing the multidimensional nature of reality. Every point of existence is defined by the many dimensions that intersect at that point. It gives a point of existence its uniqueness, but also its interconnectedness with every other point. It means that nothing is ever repeated exactly. It also means that as the universe expands, countless more dimensions are constantly being created. Nothing is a set piece forever, including ourselves. I believe the existence of evil is a natural occurrence, as is collective intelligence. As the universe expands, so does evil and it will find ever new ways of expressing itself. The challenge for us when it comes to defining evil is to identify what dimensional planes are required to come together for evil to exist. I believe that somewhere in the web of existence is a hub of evil. Some would call it hell. There may even be several such hubs, but from this hub reaches out across time space from points of existence that are beyond our ability to detect. This is not supernatural. This is the nature of how existence is. For creatures such as us humans, with brains and a capacity to suffer and inflict suffering, we are a crop to feed off like any other food source. A car travelling at 70 miles per hour does so whilst the Earth hurtles through space at 66,000 miles per hour, and the solar system at yet another speed, and the galaxy at another speed again. We act and try to come to terms with the world using the subjectivism of our own minds and use measures that we can relate to. By doing so, we assume that we are being objective when in fact we are using relativity of meaning to comprehend things. In practical terms, it does not matter to the car driver about the speed of the earth, as it is not seen as relevant. Similarly, it does not matter to those who are suffering where the origins of evil are, or how evil is acting in another part of the universe. What is more important 
is to be able to identify its characteristics and be aware that it can occur anywhere, in anyone and at any time, especially in ourselves. Evil can steal your mind without you realising it. It can turn an otherwise kind and benevolent person into something monstrous and destructive. Neither being intelligent or stupid are defences. Only an awareness of the nature of evil, coupled with the capacity to recognise its presence, can be any sort of protection. By studying the behaviour of psychopaths, I believe we can get an insight into how evil behaves at a human level. It is my contention that psychopaths, sociopaths and destructive psychotic actions act in the interests of evil, with psychopaths being perhaps its purest conscious form. Dangerous psychotics are the inanimate form and sociopaths somewhere in between. So in conclusion, I end with the eternal war of good versus evil. During our brief lives, we obtain energy, initially at the microscopic and cellular levels. This energy, gained in the form of food, is then absorbed in increasing amounts and enables us to grow and develop as per our genetic code. However, it is not a one-way street because we are simultaneously emitting energy as we strive to do things demanded of us. Our lives are all about a process of acquiring and emitting energy until eventually we die. But what if it was not quite as innocent as that? What if our lives are blighted by infestations of parasitical elements that feed off our energy and physical form? It is possible that the ageing process is not just to do with the programming of our DNA, but is being assisted by ethereal parasites that quicken the process. Nothing can operate outside the laws of nature, but what if these ethereal parasites function within those laws in the form of diseases such as cancer? Cancer cells can be physically identified, but supposing these malignancies are also linked into the malevolent forces of an ethereal kind. Cancer consumes its victim in much the same way evil consumes, but also inflicts untold suffering in the process. If this is the case, then it is possible that another front against diseases such as cancer could be opened up and explored. In spite of the terrible consequences of sharing a universe with evil, there is a counterforce to quell its influence. There are agents of good that help to combat the worst effects of evil, and you most probably meet them all the time, but do not even realise it. When someone is able to relieve another of suffering, they are driving back evil and denying it nourishment. Small acts of everyday kindness and compassion can drive back the presence of evil within yourself. Giving an exhausted bumblebee a few drops of watered-down honey to give it strength, relieving suffering of a sick person or rescuing a child are all the actions of angels. An angel is not a mythical creature with funny wings. It is a person, a creature, a force that acts in the cause of good and relieves suffering. As a child, I witnessed a mother hen after ensuring her chicks were all fed, then feeding visiting sparrows with the food from her own pot. Was this simply instinct, or did that bird show true empathy for other creatures? It doesn't matter whether she felt empathy or acted instinctively. The effect was kindness, which is an element of good. She was an agent of good, and laughable as it may seem, an angel, a real-life angel, may not be some mythical figure with wings, but in this case, it took the form of a real bird. A person acting as an agent of good may not always maintain that persona and will still be prone to evil seduction. Evil has a corrupting element that can twist, sow chaos and pervert good intentions. A great deal of negative energy can be harvested when this happens. Righteousness can be turned into self-righteousness and virtue signalling, which are associated with narcissism, an element of evil. Causes 
and belief systems can set out with good intentions, but become corrupted and twisted into inflicting harm in the name of that cause. For those who strike out with the intentions of fighting evil, the path can be narrow, treacherous and at times a very lonely one. By contrast, evil can manipulate masses of people into acting and behaving with hostility, even against the most humble and unassuming. It can take great courage to stand up in the name of good, especially against an hysterical and assimilated group or mob. Earlier I said that whether God exists or does not is a binary question and here I must confess my belief and to explain my perspective and my own religious bias. I call myself a neopantheist. What this means to me is that I believe that the universe itself is God. It means that we are all part of God's corporeal form. All good, all evil, all physical and ethereal forms are all part of God. This view is heretical and blasphemous to some faiths because it claims that God contains evil. And as we are all part of God, then we are therefore all children of God. However, it also means we are brethren to all other things, both living and inanimate. It means that, as with a blood relative, we should go about our lives having respect for all things both living and inanimate. It does not mean we should not kill. It does not mean we should not defend ourselves. It simply means that we are related to all other things, even in the most tenuous of ways. It means that if we do have to kill, we should do so with reverence to the things that we kill, and we kill in a way that minimises suffering. Nothing is supernatural. God is both male and female and neither, and is subject to the natural laws of science. This concept opens our minds to accepting that possibilities of things happening are broader than humans can imagine. It allows us to marvel at the glory of God when we marvel at the wonders of the universe. However, it also raises the real possibility of the existence of evil as an actual entity, but also of the existence of good.